Hey, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be a presenter this year at GopherCon 2020. Last year was my first GopherCon, and San Diego sure did not disappoint. My name is Travis Smith, and I'm a senior software architect at Workiva in Ames, Iowa. I work primarily on data frameworks and calculation systems. So today I'd like to share with you my experience of building a spreadsheet calculation engine and some of the tricks that I have tried along the way to improve performance. So I'll start today with the basics of spreadsheets. What are they and how they are used? As well as some terminology that we need for this talk. Then we'll look closer at how to calculate formulas, including things like lexical analysis, parsing, syntax trees, and post-order traversal. We'll make sure to look at performance along the way of the system so that we can find areas that can be improved. Next, we'll focus on two different ways that I've tried to increase performance. The first approach is to design and build a virtual machine, including our own intermediate language and compiling formulas to bytecode. The second approach is to convert our code directly to Go code that be, can be compiled and loaded back in to run using Go plugins. Finally, we'll sum everything up, spreadsheet pun intended, and we'll look to see if we've created value for, for us in the real world. So we have a lot to do, so let's get started. So a spreadsheet arranges data in a table of cells. Cells are arranged in a grid of rows and columns, and every cell can be referenced by its row and column using a letter number combination like A1 or C5. Every cell can hold either a value, which is an entered value, or a formula, which is a calculated value. And formulas can chain together by referencing other cells. Here you see the first five numbers of the Fibonacci sequence expressed as a chain of formulas. The ability to chain formulas together is what gives a spreadsheet its superpower. Many problems can be broken down into a series of smaller steps and these can be assigned to individual formulas in cells. But before we begin, we have to learn how to calculate a formula. Calculating a formula has three main steps, lexical analysis, parsing, and interpreting. So let's begin by looking at the first step, lexical analysis. Lexing is the process of splitting a stream of text into tokens. Each of these tokens will have its own assigned meaning. We use a scanner to find the tokens in the input stream, and that scanner is most likely based off of a finite state machine. Here in our Lexer package, you can see the definition for the token struct includes the text, which will be coming straight from the formula, as well as the token type, which assigns the meaning to that token. We have many different token types, including string, number, identifier, and range, as well as some punctuation types like comma and parentheses. For today's talk, we're going to focus on this example formula, which takes the sum of the range A1 through A5 and adds it to the expression 7 minus 6. So the lexer run method is a loop that continues to advance in the stream of characters and look for the state that we should be in. So when we begin, we're pointing at the first character, which is this S, and that is an identifier character. So that means we go into our lex identifier method and we will continue in that as long as we have identifier characters. So here we have an identifier character and we continue in our loop. Now we're pointing at the U, and it's also an identifier character, so we continue. And even with the M, we continue. But here we're pointing at a character that is not an identifier character. And so we will back up one in our input stream, and we will emit a token. The token that we emit is type identifier, and its value is sum. And you can see it as a green token on the right. Next, we're pointing at this open paren, and that's a symbol. So we just emit a L paren token. 
Now we're pointing at an A, and this is not an identifier, but actually a range. So inside of Lex range, we will continue as long as we see a cell character. Here's an A and a 1. Both are valid for <coughs> cell characters. And then we come to this colon. And the colon is accepted as part of this input, but we only want to see one colon ever because a range can't have more than one colon in it. So we'll set a scene colon value to true and we'll continue. The A and the 5 are both cell characters, so we'll continue until we hit this comma, at which point we back up in the input stream again and we're going to emit a token of type range. And the value is A1 through A5. With this comma in the input stream, we lex a symbol and emit a comma token. And now pointing at the seven, we have a digit. And so we are going to call lex number. Numbers can be very difficult to lex because they can be in decimal or octal or hexadecimal. They might have exponents. They might have floating points, things like that. But for today's example, it's going to be really simple. We have a digit, so we continue. But now we have a minus symbol, which is not a digit anymore. So we're going to back up and emit our token. It's a number token, and the value is 7. We have a minus symbol, so we're in lex symbol. But minus and plus and others are special because they're actually math operators. So we will emit a token of type operator with the value of minus. Once again, we're pointing at a digit, so we're in lex number. We have a six, and so we continue. But now we have this closing paren, which is not a digit, so we're going to back up and emit another number token for the value six. Finally, we are on the right paren, and so we will emit a new token of type R paren. And that's it. We have our formula, and now we have our list of tokens that represent the meaning behind the characters in our formula. So now that we have tokens, what do we do? We are going to parse our tokens to an abstract syntax tree. So parsing is the process of analyzing our tokens to form a data structure. The input stream will be checked for correct syntax and rules will be defined using a context-free grammar such as this right here. For example, a function call is described as an identifier followed by an opening parenthesis and some number of arguments and a closing parenthesis. Arguments is defined as either a single argument or a single argument followed by a comma and a list of arguments. So you can see here we have a recursive definition for arguments. Finally, argument can either be an entire formula of its own, or it can be empty, which allows us to have a function call with zero arguments. An abstract syntax tree is built to represent the formula. So here is an example where a formula is represented as a tree, and this tree really captures the essence of the formula, the semantics. Looking at the parser package, we see that the node is an empty interface. We have two main kinds of nodes for parsing. We have the literal values here, which are represented by bools, numbers, strings, and ranges. And then we have more advanced nodes. The operator node has an operation, like an addition or subtraction, and it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side. The function node has a name of the function as well as a list of arguments that go to that function. So once again, here's our example formula and also our token stream that we have as a result from the first step. We're going to put the tokens up at the top and start by pointing at the first one. And we'll put our AST output up in the top right. So first of all, we're looking at an identifier token. And so we will look for a function call. If you look at the bottom, you'll see the grammar for a function call again is an identifier followed by an opening parentheses and arguments and closing parentheses. So right here, we're looking to peek ahead at the next token and see if it's an L paren. And because it is, we're going to 
recurse down into our function code. Because we're looking for a function now, we're going to peek again and see if the next token is a right paren. Because if it is, we've met our criteria for an empty zero argument function call. But because it's not, we're going to get the first argument by beginning to parse from here. When we parse this, it's just a range token. So we add that to the AST output on the top. Then we're going to go through a loop that represents our comma and our next arguments because we have more than one argument to the function call. So we match the comma here and then we call begin as well again. So we now have a number seven token. And because it's a number, we throw that back in the AST output. But when we get to this operator token, a very interesting thing happens where the previous token becomes the left-hand side of this tree. And we build the subtree from that number seven. And we back up. When we go to the next number, we're going to, in a loop, keep building right subtrees. And when we do that, we have the number six, but we rotate that tree by rolling it up. So the operator for minus actually operates on the token before it and after it. So the number seven and six become the left-hand side and right-hand side of that operator. And then we add it to the AST output up above. We would continue to do that by replacing the left-hand side of our expression with the previous left-hand ex expression with a new operator if we had more operators. But in this case, we just have the final token, which is the right parentheses. And when we do that, we return the node and we're done. So for our formula, you now see the AST that we have lexed and parsed that represents the meaning of the sum formula. This is a really simple formula, and so it's a really simple and small tree. But some spreadsheet formulas are very, very complex, and so their ASTs can look something like this. Or as another example, with a lot of repetitive subphrases and a very deep call, we have something like this. Now for the final step, we have our AST, and we want to calculate our formula. So to set a bit of context, we're going to show a spreadsheet on the left. And because our formula references a range of A1 through A5, it would be nice to have values in there. So we're going to put some numbers in there. We'll also put our formula in cell B1. So on the right, you see some example code where we create a new engine of type simple and we create a new sheet with our engine. We'll cover that in just a moment. Then we set cell values for A1 through A5, and we set our formula on cell B1. Finally, we call calculate to calculate our sheet. A calculation engine is just a simple interface that allows us to do two things. It allows us to parse a cell at a specified row and column, and it also allows us to calculate a cell at a specified row and column and return the result. So a cell object has the location of the cell specified by a row and column, as well as the display text of the cell and the result of the cell, especially if it's a calculated cell, a formula. If it is a formula, we have an indicator to say that it is, a Boolean, as well as a pointer to the root node of the AST. Those results, though, are a special, a special struct that's a, a, a union struct of numbers, text, and range references. The result also has a type that can specify if it's a bool or a decimal or a string or a range. And there's also a special result type called empty that lets us spec uh, specify that this result is a formula that has not yet been calculated. So the first thing was to set cell A1 to 1. When we call set cell on sheet, we check to see if that cell is a formula or not. And in this case, it's not. And so we call set result with the 
a result that is created from the text that we specified. We specified a text of one, and from text is going to try to determine if it should be a bool or a decimal or a string. In this case, we can convert that into a decimal, and so we will create cell A1 with the text of one and the result of 1.0. We'll also do that for cells A2, A3, A4, and A5. Now for the interesting part. When we come to set the cell B1, we have a formula. And because it is, we're going to call the parse method on our calculation engine. Our simple engine will just get the cell at that location and call parse AST. And of course, we've already seen this AST in the previous section. Once that's done, we now have a cell B1 with the formula as our text, and we have the AST pointing at the root node of the tree. And we set the result to empty, again, to specify that this formula has not yet been calculated. So all that's left is to calculate the spreadsheet, and that's what we're gonna do. So the calculate method will get the cell and call calculate node on that root node of the AST. We're going to use post order tree traversal to calculate the AST. And if you don't remember post order algorithm from computer science class, we basically are going to traverse the left subtree, then traverse the right subtree or trees, and then visit the root. I learned this in high school with my graphing calculator and HP series, and they use something called RPN, which is reverse Polish notation. At the time, it was very confusing and and all of the calculations seemed backwards and out of order, but now it makes a lot more sense. So we're gonna call calculate node for each node, and here you can see that it's just a switch on the node type, and then we're going to return some type of result. So we'll start with our first node, our root node, which is a function node. And so the function code will take the list of arguments to that function and will recursively call calculate node on each one. So we'll start at the first argument and we'll descend to the left. This node is a range node and after converting the text to an actual range object, we're going to call a helper method called for each that will take every cell in that range and call calculate on that. That way all the values are calculated. Now in this case, we had entered values in each of those cells, so there's nothing to calculate. And we return the, re the resulting range. Now we're going to go to the next argument of the function node, and it's an operator node. And so on operator nodes, we're going to calculate the left-hand subtree first. So we'll descend down here to this node. It's a number node with a value of seven, and so we'll return a decimal result of seven. Then the operator node will calculate the node for the right-hand subtree, which in this case is another decimal result of value 6. The final step for the operator node is to convert the operation, which was a minus, to a function name, in this case sub for subtract. And then it will call the function by name with the left result and right result, the 7 and the 6 and seven minus six is one. The functions are defined on an interface and we can call them by ID or we can call them by name. Here you can see the math functions like add and subtract, as well as all of the other common spreadsheet functions like concatenate and sum and value and indirect and VLOOKUP and so many more. But if we look at the sub function, we just see that we have two arguments that we need to convert into decimals, and then we do the subtraction, and we return a new result of decimal type, and it's a one. So finally, we can complete our very first root node of function type. We've gone through all the arguments, and we've calculated those nodes. So the only thing left is to call this function by name, passing in the arguments and we're calling the sum function. When we call the sum function, we're going to loop over the arguments and we're going to sum up the values. So we have a range. How do you have a value for a range? And the answer is that first highlighted area. 
When we have a range, we need to call apply to range and tell it the function that we want to apply to it. In this case, it's our own function, sum. And the code for that is down below. When we do that, we will get the results in that range. All five cells have results. And we will call the sum function on that. This is equivalent to saying sum of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, which would be 15. So we'll return that result of 15. And we'll add it to the sum up above. Then we will take the 1 from the right-hand side, 7 minus 6, and we'll sum that and return a result decimal of 16. So we had our result, which was empty, saying that we had not calculated, but now we have. So we'll set the result to 16. Nice try, Gopher. It's not 14. So what about performance? In order to monitor and measure performance, we're going to build our demo application. And in this case, we'll run it with specifying the engine type simple, which uses our interpreter we just built. And we'll do a CPU profile so that we can use pprof and look at the output in a visual way. Here you can see a flame chart for calculating 100 million formulas. <clears throat> and overall, not bad. It took us 92 and a half seconds, so about a minute and a half for 100 million formulas. But when you look at the calculate method, you see that we're spending half of our time parsing the AST and half of the time calculating the node. I'm not sure why we're doing this because we should have already parsed the AST. And sure enough, when we look at the code for parse, we parse the AST. But when we look at the code for calculate, we're also parsing the AST a second time before calculating. When we remove that, we will get an improvement of 53%. And so our time is now down to only 92,000 nanoseconds per operation. That's pretty great for only parsing each formula once. But looking at this chart, I see that we're doing an awful lot of memory allocations inside the operator. This makes sense because every time we do an operation, we're creating a new result and we're returning that. Here you can see for decimal, we return a new decimal result. But what if we pre-allocate and pool our result objects instead? We know that we are going to be using a lot of result objects throughout the calculations. So by creating a pool and using the pool to get a result that's ready to go, we can decrease our time again, another 28%. So now it takes only 30,000 nanoseconds per operation. So here's our benchmarks so far. We've already tripled the speed of our calculation engine just by looking at the profile and seeing some kind of silly things that we were doing. These are easy wins for us to improve our system. So overall, we've shaved 66% off of our original calculation time. But can we do any better? For example, if we were to load our spreadsheet from disk, we would have to completely recalculate our ASTs for all of our formulas by parsing. So can we avoid reparsing formulas when reloading a spreadsheet? So my first idea to have a performance improvement is to design and build a virtual machine. Now most of this is the same because we are going to get our AST the same way. But then we're going to convert our AST to bytecode through an intermediate code generator. And we're going to be able to use our bytecode to evaluate our formula using a VM runtime. So we're designing a computer. And a virtual machine is just an emulator for a computer. <clears throat> it could be a real computer or an imaginary one, like ours. An intermediate language provides the abstraction and portability that you need. So we don't want to build something that needs to be run only on Windows or Mac or Linux. And we want it to be abstract enough that we can use it for what we need and not what someone else wants. Our code will execute in a domain-specific runtime environment. And for our case, the domain is a spreadsheet formula. And the instruction set of the target runtime is called the bytecode. 
I know this sounds crazy, but we are going to just want a simple instruction set and a simple runtime. So don't worry. As part of a simple instruction set, we need to consider a few things. First of all, we will need to have the ability to do literal values like booleans, numbers, and strings, and probably ranges and cells too. <clears throat> we definitely need math operators, so add, subtract, multiply, and divide. We also need to be able to call functions like sum and length, concatenate, and all of the other common spreadsheet functions. And then we, we should be able to do conditionals, so an if. All of a sudden, it doesn't look simple anymore, does it? But don't worry, it actually is much simpler than what you see here, because we really only have three categories of instructions. We have literal values that can be loaded or pushed into our system. We have function calls, and we have conditionals that need to do comparisons and jumps. We also want a simple runtime, so let's just use a stack. And all of our function arguments will be popped from the stack, and all of our results will be pushed right back onto the stack. So that's it. It's easy. And this is one reason why so many popular VM languages use a stack-based model. So let's learn how to generate instructions for our VM. We want to compile our AST to bytecode. And so once again, we'll set up our system to look like this. But this time, we're going to create an engine of type VM. In our VM engine parse, we do the parsing of the AST, but then we create a new VM and we call compile AST with the root node. Compile AST, you say. Uh, yeah, when people hear compile, they panic. They think that it's going to require a PhD and some kind of advanced compiler theory to understand this. Let me be clear. I do not have a PhD and I haven't ever taken advanced compiler theory classes at all. I haven't even read the Dragon compiler book. But we do know post-order tree traversal and we'll use that to compile the AST. So here's a compile node method on our VM. And this is just like before, going to switch on the node type and we're going to add instructions based on that. So to set it up, we'll put our AST in the top left corner and our instructions that are coming out of this on the bottom left. The compile node function on the right shows that we're starting with a function node. That's our sum function, the root node. And we want to go through all of the arguments on that node and compile nodes of those. So again, we're doing recursion. So let's go down into the left to our range node. When we compile this, we add an instruction called range and we specify A1 to A5. Pretty straightforward. Back up in our argument loop, we're going to compile the next argument, which is to the right. And this is an operator node. And just like before, the operator is going to recursively compile the left hand and the right hand side. So when we go to the left, we find a number node. And this seven will get parsed and created a new instruction for making a number. In this case, that number seven can be an unsigned int. And that's the instruction you see put down on the left. We go back up to our operator node and we need to compile the right subtree. When we do that, we put another u int for an unsigned int six. As the final step for our operator node, we are once again going to look up the function name for that operation and we're going to make a func call. That shows up as an instruction call sub.2. Sub is for subtract. And the dot two means there's two arguments to the subtract function. Dot two is just because that's what I felt like. And because it's your language, you can make it however you want. As a final step for our function node at the top, we've gone through the arguments. And so now we'll make a function call here for sum, again with the number of arguments. So it's a call sum dot two. And with that, we have taken our formula and we have compiled it down to bytecode. Here you can see the instructions. 
So great, we have bytecode, but now what do we do? Well, we need to build the VM runtime. That's how we can convert our bytecode into our calculated value. So we're ready to call the calculate method on sheet. And when we do, we're going to create a new VM with the bytecode set on that cell from when we compiled it. And then we'll run the VM. The run loop for the VM is fairly straightforward. We have a sequence of bytes. So we'll have an instruction pointer that starts at the first byte and we'll continue reading the next byte for our opcode. And then switching logic determines what we do with that. That's very, very familiar because it's what a CPU does, fetching instructions and then executing. At the very end of our run loop, we'll pop the last result off of the stack and return that, which is the result of our entire formula calculation. So we'll start with the first instruction, which is a range instruction. And when we have that, we'll read the range out of the byte sequence and we will return the result range. We also will calculate for each cell, but again, this doesn't have any formulas to calculate. The next instruction is an unsigned int. And all we do there is we read the value out of the byte stream and we return a decimal result onto the stack. You can see the stack now has the range and the number seven. The next opcode is also an unsigned int and it's a value six. And so we push that onto the stack as well. That's pretty straightforward, but here's where it gets exciting. The next instruction is a call instruction. Call instruction. And because it has two arguments, it's opcode call two. This lets us read the function that we need to call and pop that many arguments off the stack. So we pop two arguments off, the seven and the six, and now we're ready to get the result. We do that by calling the function sub with our arguments. And again, subtracting seven and six gives us one. So we're gonna push a result back on the stack of a number one. The final instruction is another opcode call with two arguments. And so we're going to read that and we're gonna pop those two arguments off the stack. Finally, we make the call to sum with those two arguments. Now, if you remember before, when we're calculating the sum, when we have an argument that's a range, we need to call the apply to range with our function, which is sum. When we do that, we get the results in the range <clears throat> so that we can sum them. So it's equivalent to doing this. Now our left part of the tree is a sum of the numbers one through five, because those were the values in cells A1 through A5. Sum of A1 through five is 15, and now we can sum the 15 and one to get 16 back on the stack. Finally, we pop that result off the stack, and that's the result of our calculation. So our result is no longer empty, it's 16. And once again, Gopher, you got it wrong. So what about the performance of our VM? Well, once again, we'll build our application and we'll run the demo with uh, the engine specified as VM and we'll do a CPU profile so that we can load it in PProf. When we do, we see that calculating with our virtual machine has actually increased our time to 35,000 nanoseconds per op, which means we've actually lost 16%, which is kind of disappointing for all that work. Where's the payoff after all? But then we look at this and we see that we're spending quite a bit of time calling vm.new. This is because every time we calculate, we were calling this to create a new VM and then run. But again, we know that we're going to be running these VMs all the time. And then once we're done calculating, we don't need it anymore. So let's create a reusable pool of virtual machines. Instead of calling new and run, We'll actually call new from pool and we'll run and then we'll reset the VM and put it back in the pool. When we do that, we decrease by 60% more and that means we're only spending 14,600 and some nanoseconds per op. So now our benchmarks look like this. We have come a long way. In fact, we have shaved 84% off of our original calculation time. 
but we're still not done yet. Our VM compiler works pretty well, but I'm not an expert at this. Uh, there are many optimizations that we could still do to improve our VM and the runtime. Um, there's ways to manipulate the AST to optimize it to generate bytecode and reduce the number of instructions for a given formula. I plan to release a video on some of those optimizations too, so please check out my website later. But what if we could use the Go compiler to compile our formulas? After all, that team is pretty amazing and they have worked a lot to make the Go compiler one of the best on the planet. So let's look at my second idea for improving performance, which is compiling Go plugins at runtime. To compile a Go plugin at runtime, we need to take our AST and transpile that to actual Go code. Once we have that, we can build it into a plugin and then load that plugin at runtime to calculate our values. So the Go plugin system compiles packages as shared object libraries. So think of a DLL or an SO file. A plugin is a Go main package with exported functions and variables. And in fact, in our case, we're only going to have a single exported function called run. These compiled libraries can be loaded dynamically at runtime, which is how we'll use that to calculate our formulas. Also note that this is only supported on Linux and Mac OS so far. So to convert our AST to Go code, we're going to set up our system the same as before. We've created a sheet and we used an engine of, for our plugin type. We've set all the cells A1 through A5, and we're ready to set the cell with our formula. This is the interesting part. The plugin engine parse is going to do something different than the others have so far. After we've parsed the AST, we're going to try to compile our formula down. Really, it's transpiling, but we pass in the root node because once again, we're going to be doing recursion. We use post-order tree traversal to transpile the AST this time. So here's our compile method. And what you see here is that we pass in the node and some compile info, and we're going to do a switch on the node type. So we start with our AST in our root node, which is a function node. And you can see that we'll put our transpiled code down on the lower left. When we start, we are going to find those arguments and loop through and recursively compile each argument, very similar to the VM. So let's go down and left to the range. Now when we find a range node, we're going to split the range node into two parts, the A1 and the A5, and we're going to calculate offsets from the cell that our formula lives in. So up at the top, you can see our call to set cell and the formula we're setting, but our location is B1. And when we want to transpile this code, we want to express the range A1 and A5 as an offset from our location of B1. So A1 is one to the left of B1. So it's the same row, but one column less. And A5 is one column over, but several rows down. When you look at the output, you see R, which is just a helper for a range. And you see R and C minus one, which is the row and column minus one or one left. And then for the second two, you see R plus four and C minus one, which is four rows down and one column over. Now back up to our function node, we're going to call compile on the second argument. That second argument is an operator node, and operator nodes have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. So of course, we'll compile the left-hand side first. When we go down to the left, we see it's a number node, and we convert that, and we print that out. Now in the transpiled code, another helper n, which is just for number, so we have a number seven. On the operator node, we'll now call compile on the right-hand node and we get N6 because we have a number six there. To complete the operator node, we're going to join those values together with a comma and 
print the name of the function as a function call in real Go code. In this case, it's called sub. We saw that function earlier. So sub of n7 and n6. X is just our context. It has things on it, like all of our functions uh, as an interface, as well as cells and things like that. Finally, we're done with all the arguments to the function call for sum, and so we can join those back together as strings to make a call to the sum function with our range result and our subtraction of 7 and 6. So the final output gets wrapped up into this generated Go file that has a package main and a couple imports, but it really just has this single exported symbol that's called run. It's our function that we say what we want to calculate and where we want to calculate it, and it will give us our result. So in this case, we have a switch, and case B1 for our formula will return this value for a result. So how can we actually use this generated Go code? Well, we are going to need to make the Go plugin. So let's learn how to compile and run a plugin. Here we have everything set up again with our results. And in fact, B1 is ready to go. We have an empty result. It's parsed. And all we have to do is calculate sheet. But this time, in the calculate method of our plugin engine, we have a check here that sees if we need to recompile our plugin. Now, when we're setting values, nothing changes on our formula. So we don't need to rebuild our plugin. But when you change a formula, you do. And when we do that, we need to write our plugin out and build it, and then we need to load the compiled code back in. Write plugin just takes all of the code that we just transpiled and basically puts it in placeholders inside of a template and writes that out to a file. And in fact, we just saw what the generated Go file looks like. Build plugin just makes an executable call to the Go command to build our plugin using build mode equals plugin and specifying an output file of plugin.so. So then you can see that we'll load the compiled file plugin.so. Load compiled is where all of the really cool stuff happens because this is the Go plugin system. We open the plugin and then we look up the run symbol. That's an exported symbol. It starts with a capital letter. And when we find that symbol, we try to cast it to our runner func uh, method signature, which has the location and the context. And when we do, we can return that run function. The only thing left to do to calculate our result is call the run function with our cells formula ID and the row column and context. When we do that, we're literally calling this code, the code that we just transpiled, but it is now compiled into a binary and loaded into our program. So this code executes just as you see it. And when it does, our result is no longer empty, but we set it as 16. And go for this is the third time you've gotten it wrong, so you're out of here. So what about the performance for our plugins? Once again, we're going to build this and run the demo and specify a plugin engine type. We'll do the CPU profile and we'll load up PProf. When we calculate with Go plugins, right away we see a huge improvement again. We've shaved another 35% off, and so now it only takes 9,500 nanoseconds per operation. So our total benchmarks look like this. And that is a phenomenal 10x increase in the amount of formulas we can calculate in the same amount of time. In fact, we've shaved 90% off of our original calculation time, which means we're going faster than ever, faster than the flash. Go plugins for the win. But can we do even better? Yes, we can. But I'm going to save that for another time in another video. Once again, check my website, and I hope to have a whole series of videos that have come from this content. But I do want to have one warning though, and that is plugin systems are kind of slow on the upfront. So writing the plugin Go code doesn't take very long, but building a plugin can take over 700 milliseconds, and loading the compiled plugin and finding our run symbol can take another 160 milliseconds. 
So really, we're talking almost a full second to build and load this thing. So if we were changing formulas a lot in our spreadsheet, we would never want to do this. Creating the plugin is extremely slow, but using the plugins are very, very fast. And so if we had a spreadsheet that had all the formulas set up and were kind of locked down, but we just were changing data values, we would definitely consider using plugins because the execution of all of the formulas would be near instantaneous. So the lessons that we've learned today is how to improve performance. And the first one is just look for ways to do work as, as few times as possible. Um, we saw early on that we were parsing the AST twice. When we do that, it was killing our performance times. And when we fixed it, we saw huge improvements. We also were considering rebuilding plugins more often than we need to. We really only want to do that when we have a change to our formulas. We want to use object pooling to reduce runtime memory allocations. We know that we're going to need the objects in memory, and we're going to use a lot of them in some cases, especially if we're calculating large spreadsheets with many, many formulas. So we might as well allocate that memory up ahead of time and have pools of objects to save us from the memory allocations and the garbage collection along the way. You should definitely create a VM if you think that the added performance is worth it. Keep in mind that there's also the complexity costs of adding all that logic to your code, as well as the maintenance costs ongoing. But one nice thing is the bytecode is much more compact compared to a string representation of a formula. So you could store a lot more formulas in less space. Finally, you should use a Go plugin if you need that absolute speed and you can amortize the compile time cost. So it does take almost a second, so it's not for everybody. One lesson, one other lesson that I learned is that creating 250 slides takes a really, really long time, like months of evenings and weekends. And for that, I want to say thank you very much to my wife, Sarah. You have allowed me to do this and present at GopherCon, which was a dream of mine. And so I want to say thank you for all the times that you've watched the kids and kept up with the house while you knew that I was working on this. I really appreciate it. And for all of you gophers out there, I want to say thank you for watching my talk. Hopefully you've learned something new and you were excited to try to build your own calculation system, maybe a VM or play with the plugin system. Uh, I hope you had a great time and I hope to see you next year at GopherCon 2021. Bye.